Five seconds to the open. Ready? Who wants to get this thing started right about now? Welcome to Follow the Money Weekly with your host, Jerry Robinson. Welcome. Not just some guru. Oh, oh, really? Your host is an economist and a best-selling author. What an interesting news item. I'd better write that down. And just someone who likes to make money and help you to make money. Welcome to Follow the Money Weekly. And here he is, Jerry Robinson. Ah, uh, friends, welcome to this week's edition of Follow the Money Weekly Radio. So glad that you're joining us all around the world. You can find us online at followthemoney.com. You can also find us on social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. And we are on YouTube. Hundreds of videos there that you can go back and watch. We've made over the years on different topics. In fact, I was going through our YouTube list uh, last week and found several videos that we had made regarding the uh, 2013 Syrian attack. Remember the big chemical weapons attack that killed so many civilians in Syria back in 2013. It caused President, uh, then President Barack Obama to issue a red line, talked about a red line. And then, of course, uh, nothing really ever came of that threat. And so now here we are four years later, and we have almost a deja vu. We have another chemical attack supposedly or allegedly conducted by the leader of Syria, the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad. And this, of course, led to a dramatic shift in the tone and in the policy of President Trump, who had entered the office uh, largely ignoring Bashar al-Assad, really focusing instead upon Assad's enemies, and that is ISIS. Remember, ISIS is in the middle of Syria. They're in the middle of Iraq. They're running roughshod over many of the local government's territories in those two countries. So now we have uh, President Trump changing his tune, first saying that he was going to go after ISIS, and now suddenly uh, changing his target to focus on Bashar al-Assad because he allegedly gassed his own people. Now, I've got to say this up front. I don't know where you stand on this whole thing. I think that it's difficult for any of us to be able to stand on anything firm regarding this because it's there's so much fog. There's so much unknown. I mean, unless we were there, unless we actually saw the evidence with our own eyes, then we really don't know what happened. Now, we are told by the intelligence agencies here in the United States that the chemical strike against the people, against the civilians in Syria was conducted by Bashar al-Assad, by the president of Syria himself. And that's the same thing we were told back in 2013 as well. The problem is that the intelligence agencies are the same intelligence agencies that President Trump was at one time at war with and said that you couldn't believe them. And in fact, if we just go back just a couple of weeks or even a couple of months it was the GOP who was telling us that the intelligence community was compromised and could not be trusted and that they, the deep state was out to get President Trump. B but suddenly, literally, as soon as this attack took place, President Trump and many of his followers, not all, in fact, there are many who have not followed him into this foray into Syria, but some of his followers have decided that the intelligence agencies who they used to think were lying to them, uh, now are telling them the truth, but still without giving them any proof. And so we are told now by the intelligence agencies and by the White House and by uh, virtually the every single corrupt, corporate-controlled mainstream media outlet that Bashar al-Assad gassed his own people. Now, is it possible for us to know this? Well, I guess if they have real evidence, they could show it to us. They could show it to us uh, so that we could support uh, their bombing. But in fact, that is not what has happened. 
Uh, they have not shown us really anything in the way of evidence, just as they did not back in 2013. So there is a big fog around who did this. Now remember, in Syria, you have many, many different factions all fighting and destabilizing Syria. And so Syria has been at war for a long time. You have groups like ISIS, you have the Al Nursa Front, you have Al Qaeda. Uh, by the way, Al Nursa and Al Qaeda are our buddies in Syria, and not so much in other places, but the United States is propping up elements of Al Qaeda and Al Nursra in Iraq. And they are fighting supposedly against other factions of radical Islam in Syria, but especially against uh, Bashar al-Assad. And then you also have the Islamic State, you know, ISIS there. We have, you know, other groups, uh, the Kurds. I mean, there is just a big, big powder keg in Syria, and there's a big fog. So many of us don't really know exactly what's happening. We hear the reports we see the things that are going on around us, but we don't really have anything in the way of firm, hard evidence of what's really occurring there. And so, given the fact that the United States government does not have a great track record for telling the truth, and especially since we know historically that the CIA uh, helped Saddam Hussein deploy chemical weapons, in his own country, and despite the fact that we sold chemical weapons to Saddam Hussein, and despite the fact that we know that the United States was actually helping al-Qaeda and al-Nusra and many of these radical factions in Syria learn how to obtain chemical weapons, and this is a report by the AP uh, and many of these other outlets that had put this information out, it got very little traction in the news, but there are numerous stories that show that this story should not be taken at face value. This story should not be taken at face value. We cannot just believe whatever our government tells us regarding these foreign adventures that we find ourselves in. If, if history tells us anything, it's that we must be skeptical when our government wants to go to war. Now, in the buildup to the Iraq war, I was someone who was watching from afar. I had seen what had happened on 9-11. And then, of course, the buildup to war in Afghanistan and then the war in Iraq in 2003. And we were told by our intelligence agencies that Saddam Hussein definitely had weapons of mass destruction. And he definitely planned on using them to destroy our interests and us ourselves, that we were under dire threat unless Saddam Hussein was taken out. Remember the story? That's exactly what the corrupt corporate mainstream media sold you back in 2003. There were very few dissenting voices. In fact, the voices that did dissent were marginalized, were castigated, were persecuted, and were considered ridiculous. And this is what happens when the fever pitch for war begins to build. So when the images and the videos came out of those innocent civilians in Syria just last week, all of us were touched. Those were horrifying images. If you happen to see those, those were horrifying. To see babies and children just suffering because of nerve agents that were, I mean, it's just, it's too much for the mind to, to take in. And so obviously, we wanted some sort of justice. Obviously, the American people wanted some sort of justice for this. But friend, it's always interesting what actually ends up and what we end up seeing on the evening news. It's always interesting to see what actually makes the evening news. Just not too long ago, there was a report put out that 200 civilians were killed in barrel bomb attacks by the United States military in the city of Mosul in Iraq. That story got very, very little airtime. And by the way, I don't think it came with any pictures. Do you recall any pictures of innocent civilians dying from American bombs? No, there weren't any. How about Yemen? There are hundreds 
or thousands of innocent civilians dying in Yemen thanks to Saudi Arabia and U.S. bombs being dropped on that country by innocent civilians dying. And there are no pictures that make the evening news of this. In Somalia and in other parts of the world, especially in Western Africa, there are tremendous amounts of people who are dying at the hands of radical Islam. These are children and women. But these don't keep President Trump up at night for some reason. So what is it about Syria? Why are the children in Syria so precious to Donald Trump, but the children of Africa and the children of Yemen and the children of Iraq, why are they not so precious and important to President Trump? The answer comes when you follow the money and you discover that Syria lies at the intersection of a massive pipeline. It's a big debate that has been going on for years. Syria has been in the crosshairs now for many years. The West has been unable to shake down President Bashar al-Assad. He has support amongst his own people. The Christian community within Syria for many years now has been saying this is nonsense. We are, in fact, the Christians in Syria are fearful of all of the Al-Qaeda and the Al-Nusra and the ISIS that have been let in and the U.S. bombs now. This is, we have turned Syria into a total quagmire. If children need to be protected, then I would like to see the U.S. military use its might and go save those children. But it's not interested in saving any kind of children, only those that happen to be in the way of big corporations, the ones that stand in the way of profit. So Syria, in this case, has been at the middle of a massive, massive pipeline quagmire, pipeline politics. I'm not going to regurgitate all of that now. I've written about it. Yeah, I'm going to put links in today's show notes where you can read about the Iran, Iraq, Syria pipeline that has been planned since 2011, uh, maybe even earlier called the Friendship Pipeline. It's a competing pipeline with the Gulf Air. Look, this whole thing in the, in the Middle East is a Sunni-Shia divide. It's a Sunni-Shia divide. The West sides with the Sunnis, right? So Al-Qaeda, ISIS... Uh, Saudi Arabia, and just go down the list of the Arab allies. These are all the Arab allies. Who funds ISIS, right? You don't have to look very far. You can go, you can go f Google that, and you can discover that there is a tremendous amount of information that connects Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia to ISIS, funding ISIS, right? Propping them up. Now, why would they want to fund ISIS? Because ISIS wants to go take down the Shiites, they're going after the Shiites, right? So, I mean, it makes total sense that the Sunnis would support their own. And you have the Shiites, on the other hand, who are fighting. So you have Iran fighting against ISIS, right? Because Iran is Shia and they, they are killing lots of ISIS in Iraq. But you don't get that in the news. You have Russia striking ISIS. And there were actually news reports coming out not too long ago where Saudi Arabia and the West were telling Russia, stop bombing ISIS. That's a real headline. Saudi Arabia and the West telling Russia, stop bombing ISIS. Stop bombing it. You, you know, why in the world would we want to stop Russia from bombing ISIS? Does anybody have an answer to that? Does anybody have any clue what's going on in this disaster? This is a total disaster. When President Trump bombs Bashar al-Assad and his air force, he is helping ISIS. I mean, that is the pure math in this whole thing, right? It's just straight up math. What would be Syria's incentive? What would be Assad's incentive to gas his own people in front of the entire world? And how, how come there's always great video cameras on the ground for these moments, but never for all these other moments, right? You never have cameras on the ground ready to go whenever America bombs and kills a bunch of civilians. Those, again, those videos just never make it to the mainstream press. How does that happen? What kind of luck is that? Friends, I, you know, 
I'm just, I'm really tired of this story. I mean, this, this story has been going on for a very long time. And I know the people living in Syria are tired of it. They're long tired of it. They are so tired of this. These people need peace. And of course, that's not going to happen as long as the United States and Russia and Iran and Saudi Arabia and everybody wants their hands and fingers in the pie of Syria because that area is a strategic place for the pipeline to run through. And Qatar wants a piece of it and Iran wants a piece of it. You have, you have a Sunni who wants a piece of it and you have a Shia that wants a piece of it. And the United States military is being dragged into this Sunni-Shia civil war. So if you listen to the mainstream press and you get their take on it, you'll find glowing reviews for President Trump. Remember, just last a couple of weeks ago, the, the mainstream press, especially on the left side, you know, MSNBC and some of CNN, you know, they were really just dogging President Trump about his Russian connections because the FBI said, hey, you know, we are investigating the Russian intrusion into the election, the 2016 election, and we are also investigating Trump and his team and their connection to Russia in the lead up to the election and after the election. And that was a really big deal, you know, to some media outlets, not all Fox acted like it didn't even exist. They, you know, Fox News was like, well, you know, the FBI says they're investigating, but so what, you know, but of course, uh, the other side of the aisle was very interested in the fact that President Trump and his team were under investigation by the FBI. That seemed to be kind of a big deal to some people. But I tell you what, you want the entire corrupt corporate mainstream media to agree on anything, you give them a bomb and you drop it on a country. That's all you got to do. And if you drop it on a Muslim country, all the better. And so check out, we got a little montage here we picked up. Check out the montage here of the glowing reviews from the corrupt corporate mainstream media as they praise Trump in his bold act of dropping bombs upon Syria which, by the way, killed a few civilians. Roll the tape. What changed last night? I think uh, Donald Trump became president of the United States. There's a new sheriff in town, and you know what? The new sheriff wants to look like RoboCop compared to the last one. I think that the moment when someone becomes president of the United States is the moment when they first really use American military might. That is a decisive use of American power. We not only took out a Syrian Air Force uh, base, we took out a terrorist airstrip. That sends quite a message. That's what's going to happen if you continue to use these chemical weapons. Now if a president said something and he backed up his words with action. This is a strong statement. This is a president who will, yes, he'll consider, yes, he'll meet and, and, and look at all the options, but he'll act, and which is not always something you could say about Barack Obama. President Trump recognized that the president of the United States does have to act to enforce international norms. This is a president who's coming off of a rocky couple of weeks, mm -hmm. arguably, uh, he's turned the page on that to some extent mm -hmm. with these foreign leader meetings that he's had this mm -hmm. week and now with the focus on Syria. I think it is amazing optics that he's down at Mar-a-Lago and he was having dinner with Xi Jinping and all of this was taking place and then he bids him good night and then this is what, uh, this is everything that's happening the rest of the evening and this morning. So it shows that he can multitask. How cool is that uh, to actually make the Chinese Politburo sit through through uh, a, a night of American-targeted bombing. In terms of the credibility of American power, I think uh, most uh, traditional Washington commentators would say uh, he's put more, uh, more oomph, more believability back into it. This is a show of force that the world needs to see and the world now knows that we will do. And everybody in the military that I have spoken to is extremely proud to call him our president this morning. It was clear to me that he wanted to do something and he did something. Um, you know, I have to say, for me personally, I, it's, I support the response. He demonstrated that he was going to act, and he did act, as commander-in-chief uh, last, last night. He took swift, decisive action, and it made Americans proud. I think it made people all around the world proud. And as 400,000 Syrians have been killed, yep. 5 million Syrians have been displaced, we finally have a man who knows the difference between right and wrong and good and evil, and it makes us proud, finally. This could be good for infrastructure spending, could be good for tax reform, could be good for health reform in the future. So it can maybe kind of unite the country a little bit more. We see these beautiful pictures at night 
from the decks of these two U.S. Navy vessels in the Eastern Mediterranean. I am tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. Um, and they are beautiful pictures of, uh, of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight over to this airfield. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful images, beautiful pictures of those bombs imploding. You know who likes those bombs imploding? Weapons manufacturers like uh, Raytheon and other bomb makers. Because remember, those bombs that they drop, those things have shelf lives. You don't want to be sitting around with 50-year-old bombs. They're dangerous. You can't do that. So you've got to buy them and drop them. Well, because these are for-profit companies, they require their users to use these things before their expiration date. So you've got to buy them, and then, of course, you've got to use them somewhere, whether you just drop them in the sea and kill a bunch of fish or whether you just go and you kill a bunch of innocent civilians. It doesn't really matter to Raytheon and all of these weapons manufacturers. All they care is that you drop the bombs. And so they've got to make more, right? So you've got to buy more. But the, let me just listen to the mainstream press fawning, fawning, over this act, I'm telling you, if there's one thing that unites the mainstream prostitutes, it is war, baby. They love war. They will support war to the dying end. They love war and they will promote war and they will tell you that war is good. Even those who detest Donald Trump can't help but show great praise to the man for being willing to drop bombs on countries because that's whenever you become a real president they say is whenever you drop bombs upon another country but what about this attack on isis i thought president trump was going to go after isis on day one i thought he was going to go in and he was going to take out isis the islamic state they're this terrible radical crew who's doing all of these terrible bad things and yet we just bombed isis's enemy and made their life a little bit easier. The White House Press Secretary, Sean Spicer, just addressed a question about this, and his answer was very, very revealing as to the goal in Syria. Let's roll the tape. Then the goal for the United States is twofold. As I've stated, it's one, to make sure that we destabilize Syria. Yeah, so that's the first goal of the United States, destabilize Syria. That's a great idea. And then the second one, I'm not going to play you for, for you, but the second one was to tell Russia who's boss. Okay, so this is just going in a really bad direction. I mean, when the White House actually admits that their goal, that their policy is to destabilize Syria, at least they're admitting it. I mean, up until this time, uh, they haven't really quite been that frank. But that is exactly the method of the United States and our foreign policy. It's to destabilize our enemies. If civilians die, if whatever the case might be happens, it's just too bad. It's just part of the war. It's just collateral damage. All right, so so let me try to bring this uh, uh, to a close. We gotta get to a break, but let me, let me just give you a two ways, two ways that I think that we can stop war in Syria, right? Stop the United States war with Syria. Here's two ways to do it. Okay, number one, if you want to stop the United States from going to war with Syria, if you want to prevent this, the very first thing that we can do is we can actually, I don't know, how about pay for it. Oh yeah, that's what we can do. We can pay for the war. Instead of just borrowing money from China to go drop bombs on countries like we've done for the last 10, 20 years, we can instead actually pay for our own war. Kind of like we did with World War II or World War I. You know, those wars that we actually sacrificed for and we had rations and we actually said we're going to stop producing tires, we're going to stop producing vehicles, we're going to stop producing homes, we're going to stop producing all of this. Why? Because we've only got so much productive power and productive capacity and we've got to use it to fight a war. And war bonds were sold and sacrifice was incumbent upon the people. But today, friends, we are at war all over the place and nobody feels it. Nobody even thinks that we're at war oftentimes. Nobody certainly feels like they're paying for it. 
And so let's fix that. Now we have the opportunity. Think about it. Right now we have a Republican in the White House and we have a Republican Senate and we have a Republican House. You've never had a better opportunity to actually have accountability. Republicans love to be accountable. They love to not go into debt. They love to be fiscally responsible. We got a perfect opportunity now. What we can do is we can create a 5% income tax, a 5% income tax on corporations and upon individuals to help pay for the Syrian war. So what we can do is we can have the Congress come to us and they can say basically this, listen, we want to go to war. We want to go to war, but we realize that we're bankrupt. We know that we're broke. We know that we can't afford to do a lot of things that we're, we're doing even right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to propose that, I don't know, we actually going to ch charge you money to actually do this war, okay? Because we don't have the money to do it. We're not going to borrow from China because we're Republicans and we are fiscally responsible. So they have the opportunity now. So they can request a 5% Syrian income tax to cover the war, right? And so basically all of us will pay five cents more on our income and there you go, there you have it. And then we can cover, and then that tax will go away as soon as the war is over. How about that? Who's for that? Raise your hand and say, oh yeah, I can see nobody is interested in that, right? Because we you gotta pay for a war. Suddenly you're thinking, now wait a minute, is this war really necessary? Do we really have to do this? Is it really, really required for, but no. If you don't have to pay for it, who cares? Go ahead, bomb the place, send our poor troops over there and blacktop the roads while you're there. Hell, we don't care. So number one, let's charge a 5% income tax to every American and say, listen, you're gonna support this with your money because we're not gonna borrow the money from China. And let's see how far we get. Let's see how quickly people step up to the plate and say, I care about those Syrian children and I'm gonna show it with my wallet. Let's see how many people actually show up to do that. And let's see how far that gets. Now, number two, the second way to stop a Syrian war with the United States is reinstate the draft. Yeah, reinstate the draft. You see, when it's just poor kids that get sent over to fight the poor of those other countries, nobody cares. When you send poor people to go fight the poor people of another country, nobody cares. So what we need to do is we need to reinstate the draft. That way, you never know if it might be you. It might be your kid. So when the rich kids start getting their number in the mail and this is, oh, I've got to go fight in Syria their rich parents will howl at the moon and say, oh, well, we can't do this. What do you expect us to go and fight in Syria? I mean, we don't have any training and we, we can't do this draft and on and on and on and on. Oh, a draft, a draft would fix this real quickly because if you knew that your number could come up, I think you would think twice before you said, hey, go send the poor of our country to fight the poor of their country. I guarantee it would cause people to stop and think a second longer about whether they really want to go to war with another country. I mean, that would change everything if you reinstate the draft because suddenly people would have skin in the game. But right now, friends, we are dropping bombs around the world and we have drone strikes around the world. We are surveilling people around the world and nobody feels like they're paying for it and nobody has to send their own child to go fight it. And so if that's the case, then you're just going to get more of that. Now, I'm not just a totally unrealistic peacenik, right? I understand that war is sometimes necessary. But if war is necessary, funding it should also be necessary, right? And participating in it and demanding sacrifice from your people should also be necessary. But we leave those two things out because we borrow the money to bomb people from China and we use the poor of this country to go fight the wars. All right, but I'm not expecting either one of these proposals to ever even make it to Washington. They would never, ever, 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 ever want to come to you and ask you for money to go bomb people. Are you kidding? They would never get your permission to do that, right? You'd say, no, I'm not going to pay for that. It's supposed to be a free thing, right? I mean, bombing countries is supposed to be kind of an inherent right as an American citizen. You shouldn't have to pay for that. That should just come along as part of the ride. And as far as a draft, I mean, give me a break. You mean I've got to go fight in these wars to protect us from terror? Why in the world should I do it whenever there are so many people who are poorer than me who are more than happy to take up that plight and go fight for us? I'm tired of these wars for oil. 
I'm tired of these wars about pipelines. I'm tired of us spending money we don't have. I'm tired of us borrowing from other countries to go further into debt to bomb other countries that we have no interest in, but that big oil has interest in. And I'm tired of the mainstream corrupt media constantly pounding it in my head that I have to support every single war that Washington comes up with. I know it's easier, friends, just to close your eyes and act like these things are not happening. In fact, that's what many of us do. But things are getting real now. We can't do that much longer. We're going to have to decide. If Mr. Trump wants more war, then let him abide by the Constitution that so many of our politicians wrap themselves up in constantly and let him appeal to it and come directly to the Congress and ask for Congress permission and let's have Congress actually have to vote on a war so you can see it in black and white. They have to approve a war resolution. Make Congress vote for this. Do not let President Trump drop bombs on countries willy-nilly without any congressional approval. It's up to you, friends. What kind of future do you want for your children and for your grandchildren? The way we are heading, we are sliding into a future of massive debt and servitude. Wall Street owns the country. It is no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but a government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for Wall Street. This is nuclear is nuclear is nuclear is nuclear is nuclear is nuclear Don't let anybody make you think that God shows America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment, and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. If you don't change your way, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power, and I'll place it in the hands of a nation that doesn't even know my name. As from 12 noon today, the central government will cease to function. I want to dedicate this song to McGeorge Bundy, to Robert McNamara, to Lyndon Baines Johnson, and to the memory of John Foster Dulles. Well, you got to read, you got to read, just what you saw, just what you saw, or you got to read. You got to read just what you saw. Just what you, what you saw. saw. You may have saw it in the day, but you will reap it anyway. You got to read. You, you got, got to read just, just what, what you, you saw. saw. What you saw. You got to read. You got to read just what you saw. Just what you saw. Oh, you got to read. You got to read just what you saw. Just what you saw. You may sow it in the night, but you're gonna reap it in the light. You gotta reap. You gotta reap just what you saw. What you saw. Oh, you got to reap. You got to reap just what you saw. Just what you saw. Yeah, you got to reap. You got to reap just what you saw. Just what you saw. You may. Yeah, what is
Are you prepared for the next stock market crash? It's not too late to protect yourself and your family with Jerry Robinson's best-selling book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, now in a new audiobook format. Whether you want to listen in the car, at the gym, or on your iPad, we've got you covered. Get the entire 300-page book in audio format for only $24.95. That's over 12 hours of Jerry Robinson's economic wisdom, financial insights, and practical money-making strategies for only $24.95. Inside this new audiobook, you'll learn 21 profitable income streams you can create both now and in retirement, along with unique tips on how to inflation-proof your investment portfolio using our own PACE philosophy and our five levels of financial freedom, which is Jerry Robinson's personal blueprint for building true wealth. If your goal is to become a better investor, increase your income, or just understand what is really happening in the global economy, you cannot afford to miss out on the vital information that is jam-packed into this 12-hour audio book. Get instant access to Bankruptcy of Our Nation in audio format right now by going online to www.ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. That's ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. Download your copy today and get on the fast track to true wealth and a lifetime of financial security. Follow the money. Just follow the money. We are going to follow the money. You follow drugs, you get drug addicts and drug dealers. But you start to follow the money, and you don't know where it's going to take you. All right, welcome back, friends, to Follow the Money Radio. So glad that you're here. Moving into our second segment here, we actually are going to be joined by John Pilger. He is an award-winning journalist, been doing journalism for a very long time, based out of Australia. He is also an award-winning documentary filmmaker. His latest documentary film is The Coming War on China. It's an in-depth look at the current tensions between the United States and the second largest superpower in the world, China. A very interesting backstory that he provides in the documentary, and especially with what's happening now with North Korea and the tensions that are rising between the United States and China with the Trump election. It's very uh, revealing to get some of uh, John Pilger's insights into the latest provocations. So let's head over to that interview right now. All right, well, joining us on the line today is an award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker with more than 50 titles to his credit. In fact, maybe 60 now with this latest film. His name is John Pilger. His latest film is entitled The Coming War on China. John, thank you so much for joining us on Follow the Money Radio. You're very welcome. I want to move to this, this topic of the plight of the Marshall Islanders in the post-World War II era as they became, in essence, guinea pigs for the effects of American radiation testing. I was not aware of this history. In fact, I would venture to say that most Americans do not know much of the history about, uh, about America, of course, but especially this. Can you fill us in a little bit more about this for those who haven't seen the film? Well, the film opens in the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands is where, following the bombing, the atomic bombing of Japan, it's where the nuclear age really began. Between 1946 and 1958, the United States exploded the equivalent of one Hiroshima bomb in the Marshall Islands. So everything from its early atomic bombs to its later hydrogen bombs were tested in the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands were a trust territory of the United States. States, the United Nations had passed in trust the welfare of the Marshall Islanders to the United States. And instead, the US really devastated the environment, both the natural environment and the human environment. Most, I think, of your readers will have heard of Bikini, perhaps mainly because his name after the bikini swimsuit, but the bikini swimsuit was actually named after the explosions 
that devastated that island of Bikini in the Marshall Islands. So it's there that the whole nuclear menace really got underway. And right in the middle of the Marshall Islands, the biggest island, Kwajalein, is the Ronald Reagan missile test site. And that was set up in the 1960s with China as, in effect, its target. And that it's one of the US's most secretive bases. So the connection with the current atmosphere between the US and China, the provocations, is really centered on that particular base in the Marshall Islands, surrounded by this, this history. You know, there was a secret program called 4.1, which began as uh, a program to examine mice, the effects of high-yield nuclear weapons on mice. And this became a program to, ex to examine the effects of high-yield nuclear weapons on human beings. So the Marshall Islands really are a dark history that are very much related to events today. Yeah, and a history and a history again that many Americans are probably not aware of, but they'll learn as they watch the film. It it provides a really striking background and a backdrop to the facts that you lay out. And I want to get to some of those facts now. That one of the things that I found very staggering from the film was the pivot to Asia that took place back in 2011, that began in 2011 underneath then President Obama. Uh, has now led, as you very cleverly show in the uh, documentary, about 400 military bases now that surround China. And it's very difficult to imagine a country not feeling threatened by that. And you really draw that out in the, in the film. So it really forces the Westerner, as they're watching the film, to think outside of their own uh, skin, to think outside of their own country, their own nationality, and to realize that this military industrial complex that has been built is now basically noosing up the second largest superpower in the world on our watch. And it's difficult, I think, for many Americans to imagine a hot war, a hot full-scale war with China, but that is the thesis of your uh, film. Talk about this coming war with China that you envision. Does the Trump administration aggravate this from your perspective? Does he make things better? What's your take on that? Well, the theme of uh, a willful ignorance on the part of the United States and American people, but uh, particularly American elites, has been the theme of most of my films, actually. And it is the major issue today that, I mean, several times in your questions, you've You've said, well, we don't really know about this. And I think the question that your readers, uh, your listeners might like to ask themselves is why they don't know. Because the pivot to Asia announced by President Obama in 2011 was not a secret. But as you say, very few people know about it. It meant the transfer of most U.S. naval and air forces to the Pacific, Asia Pacific region by the year 2020. And the object of that was to confront China. Well, that's a pretty important thing to know about. And <clears throat> in the land which has constitutionally the freest press, freest media in the world, the depth of this almost amnesia, this denial, this willful ignorance is quite extraordinary to the point where Trump arrives and you've just mentioned him, so I'll try and answer your question. Trump arrives, a kind of cartoon version of everything that's gone before, but not all that different. The kind of devastation in Syria that we're seeing and in Yemen being carried on by the Obama administration and before that the Bush administration and before that in various forms, parts of the world, the Clinton administration and so on. There's a continuity. Trump is slightly unpredictable, but there isn't a great deal of difference between him and those that have gone before. And I think it's, it is a question. It is a, probably the most 
urgent question that people ask themselves, why don't we know about this? Why don't we debate this? We're doing this on this program at the moment, and that's all well and good. But uh, as you rightly said, ask people about the Marshall Islands, a place absolutely devastated by the US, and they won't know. Ask them about bikini, they'll say the swimsuit. That's the question, why? As we look at North Korea, and that, especially as you look at North Korea, do you see that as the epicenter of this coming conflict with China? I know the South China Sea, we could talk about that as well. But North Korea seems to be a proxy, or at least they appear to be a proxy for China, a good bargaining chip for China as they attempt to maneuver and uh, deal with the United States. North Korea, yeah. how concerned should the West be about North Korea? Is it a red herring? Is it a real problem? How do you look at it? Jerry, the world should be concerned about the United States, not North Korea. Understanding the history of that part of the world, you would understand the utter devastation of Korea in the so-called Korean War in the 1950s. The whole issue of North Korea and this strange but rather predictable regime in North Korea the whole issue can be explained by the need for a peace treaty for a war that ended in 1953. And the United States refuses to sit down and negotiate a peace treaty with North Korea. Instead, we have a barrage of, of caricatures of this regime, many of them absolutely correct. It's a very strange regime and not a particularly pleasant one. But to end this danger, it means negotiating with North Korea. North Korea keeps popping up its missiles to say, well, look at us. We're still here and we still want a peace treaty. They've made it very clear. So, but if you had a peace treaty, of course, there'd be no reason to have 50,000 US soldiers in Korea. That's the, the reason for the present problems in North Korea. North Korea isn't a proxy at all, a proxy for China. In fact, China has, has tried to persuade the North Korean regime to tone down its provocations, and sometimes successfully, often unsuccessfully. But Trump appears to be beating his chest over North Korea, and if he does attack North Korea, I think people have to understand what he's really doing. He's attacking Asia because everything is close together there, Japan, China, to attack the peninsula of Korea whose, and North Korea, whose capital, Pyongyang, is uh, a few hours' drive from the capital of South Korea, Seoul. There would be devastation. That's probably the most dangerous situation at the moment, and in my view, can only be deterred by people speaking about what the issues really are on the Korean peninsula. It's been going on too long. There could be stability there. There may not be the regime that people want, but there won't be the prospect of war and nuclear war, and that's what we've got at the moment. I wonder if you think that this war is inevitable. Is it inevitable given the trajectory of the United States, given the what we know about the history of the West? Is it an inevitable war? What can be done to change this potential future that you envision? Uh, no, I don't think it is inevitable. I don't think anything is inevitable. I don't believe in that. But there is certainly a real possibility. And, you know, what could happen and what often happens with the beginning of major wars is they begin by mistake or by accident. But first, if you create this atmosphere of provocation of a sort of a rhetorical standoff between states, it's fertile ground for a war. A form of that happened a century ago in Europe during the, at the beginning of the First World War. That's the real risk here. I like to believe that even the most deranged general in the Pentagon 
uh, doesn't want to blow us all up with nuclear weapons. I may be wrong, I don't know, but I don't think so. I don't think the United States wants a nuclear war because the United States, as I think I've illustrated very clearly in my film, would itself be devastated in a nuclear exchange with a power like China. But it's this, it's this provocation, it's this risk-taking, uh, this shouting. You know, what has happened in the last 20, 25 years is that what used to be called diplomacy has almost been extinguished, that great powers, especially the United States, especially the United States, speaks in terms of the saber. The sabers are rattled. You know, that's such a primitive way of dealing with other states. So there's been a regression. We've almost lost that rather strange practice called diplomacy. But diplomacy often got us out of situations, when I say us, I mean humanity, in which we might have had a war. What can be done about it? What can be done about it is that people start speaking up and identifying what the real problems are. You know, right through the US election campaign, there was what we're talking about now wasn't even an issue. There was nothing. Now there's this absurd obsession with a complete nonsense that Russia intervened in the, in the US election, of which there is not the slightest evidence, when in fact the issue should be the very thing that we're discussing. How do you stop a war happening between nuclear armed states? Hmm. And you had brought up the uh, the generals at the Pentagon, hopefully not wanting war, but it is something that is worthy of note that our generation may not even really understand the horror of war, uh, sadly. We certainly have not had to sacrifice for wars in recent times. So it's almost as if our generation is detached from the horrors of war. We see war as kind of a inflationary event that might help the stock market. We don't see, we, we don't see it uh, for what it truly is, and that's a really sad thing. I think that's a very good point. It's a very good historical point. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at the reaction in St. Petersburg, the bombing of the underground there, I've read some very interesting commentary of, on that and how people went about their business, that the authorities immediately made all public transport and taxis free so that they could go on searching for other bombs. And in fact, they found another one. Now, <clears throat> the same thing, the same, let's say, stoicism or coolness happened in London during the IRA campaign in the 1970s when you got into an underground train and you didn't really know if you were going to be a victim of an attack. Those two countries, in my view, have known war on their own soil. The United States hasn't. You, you describe it very colorfully there, but the Second World War was actually quite a, a lucrative operation for the US, not for all those soldiers who died, of course, but even the numbers of soldiers died, the number that were few compared with, say, the 27 million who died in the Nazi invasion of Russia. So that long memory, it's not all that long, in Europe and in Russia, and in China, China devastated for most of the 19th century and most of the 20th century, actually, certainly up to, up to the mid 20th century. That memory of war and of chaos and of dispossession is very, very vivid. It's not so in the United States, unless you've got a memory that goes back to the Civil War, and I doubt whether anyone does, but that it's not there. And I think that's a factor. I think it's also a fact that, that history is not, is not taught in schools. The whole sense of, of the past and how it affects the, the present and the future is not taught. You know, technology is now so consuming us that the very basics, like understanding our past and, and learning from the lessons of our past, it just isn't there. That's one of the problems. Fascinating discussion with our guest today. John Pilger. He is an award-winning journalist and a documentary filmmaker. We're in our final moments here with him. 
He has 60 different titles to his credit. The 60th title is The Coming War on China. John, I, I would like for you to share with our audience how those who have listened to this broadcast who would like to get a copy of this film to either view it for themselves or share it with their friends and family, how can they get a hold of this film? Well, the U.S. distributor is Bullfrog Films, B-U-L-L-F-R-O-G, Bullfrog Films. It's in Pennsylvania. And there is an email address, john at bullfrogfilms, one word, dot com. I think an email to that uh, address or just look at the Bullfrog Films website. They're the distributor of the coming war in China. They do a very good job. And I, I do hope your, your listeners are able to draw something from this work because it affects them. We certainly encourage them to check it out. I saw the film, and I certainly vouch for the, uh, you know, for the research you put into it. I know you've been doing this for a long time. You ha you've been uh, speaking out about these kinds of topics for a long time, and this is a particularly compelling film, I think, for this hour. Thank you so much for joining us, John. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Jerry. All of the hearts have been taken. Follow the Money Weekly presents your Precious Metals Market Update. Here's Tom Cloud. This is Tom Cloud with this week's Precious Metals Market Update. Today, as I record this on Wednesday, April 12th, we're seeing a tremendous move to safe haven buying. We see gold up over 12 175 an ounce and silver up over $18.40. What's interesting about this is I talked to my source yesterday and again this morning in Singapore, and these are central banks. These are tons, tonnage being bought for safety based on the world geopolitical situation right now. I was talking to a, a timer yesterday and he said, Tom, I just don't see it right now. They're the gold looks like it's going to come down some and silver's going to come down. I said it might technically, but fundamentally, there's too many coals on the fire not to have some smoke. And certainly we've seen that gold is now up over 10.5% this year compared to the stock market, market at five. And silver's up 15%, three times what the stock market's up this year. I'm not telling you not to be in stocks but certainly you should have money in both areas. It's an allocation matter. You need to have a percentage of several different things as we're told in Ecclesiastes 11.2 to divide our wealth seven or eight ways because we don't know what disaster will come upon the land. Never been more prevalent in today's time with what's going on with Putin, President Trump, what's going on in Israel, Syria, and we're just seeing more and more of the Bible prophecy people talking about the invasion of Gog and Magog, which is end time theology that think that Russia and China are coming together. And here they are, they've now opened central banks in Shanghai from Russia and in Moscow from China. And we're being told that the SWIFT system that the United States has controlled for over 45 years is getting ready to lose there's going to be another alternative for payment in the world economic trade system, and it's going to be coming out of Russia and China, Gog and Magog. Can you believe that you're living in such times? But we really are. So all I can tell you is there will be a time, and I believe with all my heart after doing this for 41 years, that there will be a time in the near future, and I mean within 24, 36 months, where you will not even be able to own physical gold and maybe not silver, but gold for sure in your hands because it will be part of a new currency. We're at 20 trillion of debt in the US, 70 trillion worldwide. And this is not future obligations. This is money we borrowed that we owe. So the United States owns 20 trillion of the 70 trillion world debt and getting worse by the minute. And on April 29th, we're going to see, we're going to have to debate 
the budget or we'll have to see spending and close the government down like we did in 2012. So right now, all I can tell you is you once this stuff is settled, if uh, tensions slow in the world of Syria, U.S., China, you may see a pullback in gold. But every time, gold is moving higher and higher. And once again, there'll be a time that gold will be worth thousands of dollars an ounce in the next three years. You can quote me on it. I'm talking to too many people that are right in the middle of the fray, watching tonnage move into central banks' hands as a tier one investment where they can now evaluate it at its market value and not half of its market value like it's been in the past. So if you need to talk to us, you can reach us at 800-247-2812. That's 800-247-2812. If you are interested in putting gold into a self-directed precious metals IRA, give us a call. We'll walk you through custodian. We can function as your broker and representative, but you have to have a separate custodian but we'll give you the names of those that we use. So hopefully uh, we're seeing this change. Gold and silver look like they're gonna to continue to be the best investment as we go through uncertainty in the second quarter, just like we did in the first quarter. With this week's Precious Metals Market Update, this is Tom Cloud signing out. Hey friends, this is Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly. Recently, we have been receiving many emails from our listeners commenting on the great help they're getting from our precious metals expert, Tom Cloud. Gold and silver are excellent hedges against the growing threat of coming U.S. inflation. Who's your gold guy? Make it Tom Cloud. With over 30 years' experience with precious metals, Tom will answer all of your questions. Don't buy your gold and silver through some call center and pay inflated prices. Call my good friend Tom Cloud and speak directly with him and get all of your questions answered. For a limited time, Tom is offering free shipping and insurance on every gold and silver purchase made by our listeners. Call 800 247 2812. And when you do, tell him that Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly sent you. And he'll throw in that free shipping and insurance on your entire order. Call your gold guy, Tom Cloud, right now for the very best deals on gold and silver coins. 800-247-2812. That is 800-247-2812. All right, friends, and that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much for choosing to allow us into your life each and every week right here on this broadcast. And as always, I leave you with this final word. You know, in the lead up to the 2016 election, many evangelical pastors became very focused upon making sure that their adherents and their congregants would be showing up at the voting booths to pull the lever for one Mr. Donald Trump. One evangelical minister took this to an extreme by warning those in his TV audience of the dire ramifications that would await them if they didn't vote the right way. Listen as televangelist Kenneth Copeland explains. And and you you sit still. You sit right where you are. Don't you turn that off saying, well, I ain't going to vote anyway. You're going to be held seriously, seriously to account by God. If you don't vote, you're going to be guilty of murder. You're going to be guilty of an abomination of God. You're going to be guilty for every baby that's aborted from this election forward. And and so you you don't cut out on me right now in the name of Jesus. That's right. Amen. I forgive you, sweetheart, but you just stay right there where you are and hear us out. For those wondering which verse Kenneth Copeland must be referring to, good luck in finding it. There is no verse that tells us that we must vote in a democracy for Republicans or Democrats. No such verse exists, except in the perverted minds of those ministers who falsely equate worldly political power with godliness. And that's just something to think about. Remember friends, when you want the truth, 
Just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and we'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. the information contained on the follow the money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes it should not be construed as specific investment advice the views and opinions of our guests and sponsors including tom cloud are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of ftmdaily.com or robinson media group llc jerry robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products follow-up individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations past performance is not indicative of future results you should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussion discussed on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always